So I'm going to talk about uh, JS 5.5s, uh, where we've been, where we are, where we want to get to. Um, so. Can we see that? Oh, okay, yeah, so, so this is JS uh, This is me, I'm making brain. Um, my name's Alex Potsidis, really. Uh, you can just call me Alex. Uh, I'm making brain on the internet. Uh, that's the repo for JS IPFS and the website. JS IPFS, what's it for? What is it for? It's quite hard to break it down, really, because it's like because JavaScript runs everywhere. So it's hard to just say, yeah, it's for the browser. Yeah, it's for it's for servers, but it's for everything, unfortunately. Um, but it runs on almost every computer in the entire planet. So if you want to get IPFS onto every computer on the entire planet, JavaScript is a great place to start. So it runs on browsers, servers, desktops, mobile, to a degree. Uh, you can run it as a standalone daemon. You can run it as, a, as an in-process node as part of your application. So then you get uh, proper inspection, easy debuggability, and all that, all that good stuff. Um, it also, like, you know, JavaScript is one of the most, I was going to say it's the most popular, but I guess apparently uh, Python has now stolen that crown. Um, it's good that this is a late talk. Yeah, yeah. They'll come around. They'll come around. Um, so, yeah, 12.4 million uh, JavaScript developers are in this world, which is quite an insane number. Uh, and they could all be getting involved with JSIPFS and making it the most amazing way to share content and build distributed apps. And only 53%, more than half of all developers, use JavaScript. Like, hands up in this room who uses JavaScript or has used JavaScript at some point. I mean, that's more than half. So oh, architecture, how does it all fit together? Well, uh, it's worth considering history a little bit. So JS IPFS started off as a, as a Kubo clone, um, which has led to you know, several architectural decisions. Over time, we've kind of come to the conclusion that maybe that's not, not a great goal uh, for something as flexible as JavaScript. Um, because you then end up, so you replicate the APIs, you replicate the design decisions of, of another system, which might have different uh, requirements to the ones that you're building. For example, you know, if it runs on the server, you typically don't care about bundle size, so it doesn't matter if there's deprecated bits of the API that you keep around forever. Um, if you're running the browser, you definitely care about that kind of stuff. Also, you know, when you're in that situation, it lends itself to a kind of a kitchen sink style of implementation where somebody requests a feature, you add the feature, you never take it out, um, which is not great when you're trying to keep an API, an API small and focused and, and easy to, to understand and to, get, and, to, and to use. So we're trying to, after, after that realization, we try to break it up into smaller things. Um, so it's more of an ecosystem of modules so libp2p in particular is very uh, composable. Um, you can remove features if you don't need them, you know, which is uh, which is great because it means you can you can focus on a lot of uh, different use cases. Um, but yeah, so IPFS core uh, was the, was an attempt to remove a lot of the um, extra stuff. So if you're running an in-process node as part of your application, you're not going to want a CLI. You're probably not going to want an RPC server. So those were stripped out. So you would just use IPS core instead. Um, UnixFS is reusable. Um, it's being used by other projects outside of JS IPFS, the same with BitSwap. So you can basically pick and choose your components. So IPFS core uh, is this idea of just the, the operations that, that you would use uh, as part of your everyday use of IPFS. So it's the kind of things that are implemented by the uh, Kubo RPC API. Um, it basically talks UnixFS, like everything is based on UnixFS for IPFS, uh, which beneath that is DAGPB, uh, which is, you know, the structures 
within IPLD that, that are created that make up your Unix FS file system. Underneath that, there's BitSwap, um, which is you know how you exchange uh, the blocks. If you're exchanging the blocks, you're going via libp2p, or you're going to the bit uh, you're going to the block store if you have them already on your machine. So this is uh, yeah. So what I touched on about IPFS core being a smaller version, a bit more lightweight. So if you install IPFS, then you get the CLI, you get IPFS core, an HTTP API, and a daemon uh, versus IPFS core, where you just get uh, IPFS core itself, and you don't have all this extra baggage. So the pain points of JS IPFS. Like, what doesn't it do well? Well, I mean, it's not the kind of things that you'd think. So like JavaScript is slow, right? Everyone says JavaScript is slow. Well, not really. Like CPU intensive task, it's not fantastic at, but there are solutions. So in Node, you can drop down to C++ uh, add-ons for it. In Node and the browser, you can use WASM. Um, so things that are slow, uh, in our stack at the moment are things like um, encryption. So if you do those kind of things in WASM instead of in, but they're like, yeah, so if you do them in WASM instead of in, in JavaScript, you will see a speed up. And it also sits quite nicely because if you uh, target small pieces of the application that need to get uh, optimized, then things like WASM are fantastic. Like it's not a great fix if you wanna do like large scale systems because you're either in WASM or you're not. Um, there's a significant developer experience penalty that you pay um, if you are not completely up to speed with the code behind the WASM. Um, whereas if you're just doing very small focused uh, improvements, then, then you can, there's a significant amount of low hanging fruit. Network intensive tasks. So like browsers, uh, they are a pretty hostile environment in general for um, the kind of coding that we're trying to do. Uh, with the, you, know, you can only have a certain amount of connections open. Uh, it doesn't support it's particularly useful transports. Uh, so there's no TCP, there's no quick um, as, a, as a listener. Uh, but like, I mean, do you want your browser to be able to open TCP ports? I mean, probably not. Probably not. Like, can you imagine if there's uh, like a cross-site scripting thing that's injected by an advert onto a website that you're looking at and suddenly you're opening TCP ports everywhere and connecting to things? I mean, that sounds, sounds bad. You know, so these things are there for a reason, and they do, they protect everyone. Um, Node, it, on the other hand, is really good at networking things. Its, uh, it's event loop based model is incredibly efficient for IO. Um, so yeah, it, it's, again, it's, it's the, the, the places that you're deploying JSIPFS uh, that have different limitations, and it's something that, you, that we all need to be aware of. Macy Future Tech. So trying to, trying to do really cool stuff like Quick is, is, a, is a real shame at the moment because it solves some pretty significant problems. Uh, but there's no implementation for Node.js. Like there is, there's a PR open against Node, um, but it uses a fork of uh, OpenSSL uh, because of some things that happened with the OpenSSL uh, team and they didn't merge, I mean, check it out. It's, it's kind of, yeah, it's a bit, bit, bit uh, face palmy. Um, but yeah, so one day maybe we'll get quick in note. Uh, web crypto is how we do most of um, the cryptography. This is, what, this is the way we would like to do all the cryptographic uh, operations because it's really fast, um, but it does miss some things. So for example, ED25519 keys, there's no support in web crypto, which is really quite tedious. So we have to have either a native JS or a WASM implementation of that. And all the operations are async, even all the hashing and, 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 and that kind of thing, which is really quite tedious because you, it just introduces like artificial latency for no reason into your application. The team, the team behind JS IPFS. I mean, at the moment it's basically me, which is uh, you know, a pretty significant bottleneck but we've had some fantastic alumni pass through these hallowed gates. Uh, think of the things that they've gone on to do. Uh, amazing. Anyway, having one person on the team is not so bad. You know, the meetings, the team meetings, the daily stand-up is very quick. There's not a lot of dithering. There's very strong alignment on, on the direction of what's gonna, of where we're gonna go next. 
Um, but we're hiring, so please, you know, uh, come, and, come and help. It's really fun, honest. So traction, I mean, it's growing. IPFS, JS IPFS is growing. If you look at, so that graph there is, uh, is basically the number of downloads in the last year. And it's a nice, like it's not a crazy curve upwards, but it's basically doubled in the last year. Um, so more and more people are using this. And we also have, uh, I mean, I hope this list is accurate. We, we also have lots of people who are using JS IPFS and or parts of it, or they depend on things that depend on JS IPFS. Um, what's next? What's on a roadmap? So with IPFS, uh, we just recently switched to ESM only, because it's very important to try and like, the dream is no bundlers. The dream is like running in the browser, no bundlers, like no, no nothing, just only, uh, only JavaScript that's in the standards, uh, try and remove all the node specific stuff so that we can run on Dino and Bun. Anyone heard of Bun? I discovered this the other day. Uh, it's another, an, yet another uh, JavaScript runtime. Um, like, cause we wanna be web first basically. So we wanna, we wanna, have, a, we wanna have a smaller API like instead of this idea of trying to replicate uh, Kubo, we want to try and like have like an API that's like configurable. It's going to be uh, you can you can like choose, like pick and choose the components for your use case. So if you don't need IPNS, don't use IPNS. You know if you don't if you don't need like a DHT, don't include the DHT. Like be free. Like have a nice tiny focused bundle. I mean that would be lovely. Uh, and a name like. We're going to rename it. I don't know what T yet. Like maybe Cubo JS. <laughs> and, uh, IFPS. I like that one too. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Banana. I mean, yeah, great. It's got it's got emojis already. Like I love it. Um, yeah. So we're going to rename it. Um, I think. It's like the thing about renaming it is it's not it's not a it's not a low cost thing to do because every every package that depends on it is going to have to change its, all of its imports, um, which is incredibly tedious. And yeah, you don't like we've inflicted lots of pain on the user base through our constant refactoring, and this is another another bit of refactoring. Um, but it will be renamed. But I think it will be renamed after we have like some something better for them to to migrate to that isn't this this Cubo clone. Uh, yeah, and so in the, B2, on the, the P2P level, we're gonna, like, there are so many, there's a whole raft of improvements you wanna make. So yeah, better discoverability, connectivity, we've got like, re, like delegated uh, routing through like the new reframe protocol that's, that's being created. Like, I want to add uh, proper NAT hole punching, so uh, that would mean circuit relay v2. We wanna have like, yeah, auto NAT. We've already got um, D trick at the back. We've already got a working DHT implementation. Thank you very much. I did see that on your slide. It's been there since January. Unbelievable. Uh, what we don't have is uh, DHT server mode. Like it is there, but you have to turn it on explicitly. Um, Kubo at the moment will flip itself into server mode when it works out what its external IP addresses or external addressable addresses are, what its ex external multi-headers are. Um, so we need, we need auto NAT for that first. Um, so that we can say with, with a relative degree of confidence what our external addresses are. Once that's there, bang, we can turn on DHT server mode if you're externally addressable. Um, uh, yeah, so adding like full-time, like what's so adding real-time node uh, orchestration. So we have this uh, R HTTP RPC API, uh, which has all the limitations of HTTP, so we can't do bidirectional streaming. Um, there's like, there's a very, there's not a lot of uh, access control applied to it and that kind of thing. Uh, so instead of having like a WebSocket API, which can be event-based, so we'll be able to build like real-time applications or applications that respond to the node state in real-time, have like, we'll be able to expose the full of the libp2p API in the browser, which is just gonna be amazing. Um, I'm very excited about that kind of thing. And also like to choose your own adventure. Like you should be able to, build this thing like yourself. So we have like all these little components that we can use to create these distributed applications. Um, 
And you should be able to pick and choose them and combine them together in a way that makes sense. So trying to uh, make sure that we haven't like baked in assumptions into the interfaces that we expose and that kind of thing. Which I'm very conscious of running out of time. Um, yeah, it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna be so much fun. Oh, and that's the end. That is the end of my talk. Uh, I've run out of time. So, I mean, that's it. If you want to come and find me and ask me questions afterwards, I'll be around. I'm Alex, Aiken Brain. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>